is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate for the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate or encourage any illegal activity and advise all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws by visiting normal.org, N-O-R-M-L dot org. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers of Normal Show Live are their own and do not necessarily reflect the philosophy and policies of Normal. Listener discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think that we need to rethink and recriminalize our marijuana laws. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws presents... Normal Show Live, Marijuana Nation. Now, here's your host, Normal's Outreach Coordinator, Radical Russ Belvin. Good afternoon, tokers and tokats, and welcome. It is Thursday, February 2nd, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Thanks for joining us here for this show. Uh, glad to have you here. All sorts of great stuff coming up on today's show. We're going to have Terry Joyce from the uh, Southern California scene joining us to uh, tell us all about what's happening down there with the uh, federal crackdown. We're joined by her guest, Dan Hankin, who's an activist with the Cannabis Clubs United uh, Committee. I, I, I think I'm getting the name wrong, but he'll tell us all about that as we get to the uh, to the interview. Also on today's show, we have got an interview with Jorge Cervantes from his, uh, his uh, uh, house in... In Barcelona, uh, Spain, where he's growing uh, some fantastic marijuana. He'll tell you all about that. And of course, his uh, latest developments in his career and his promotions. But before we get to all that, let's go to our virtual studio in beautiful Grastoria, Oregon, where our senior news editor, Cannabis Carrie, is standing by. Hello, Carrie. Hi, Russ. Happy Groundhog Day. Happy Groundhog Day to you. And happy birthday to our good friend, Herb Thrasher from Normal Rocks with Herb Thrasher. It's his birthday today. Nice. Happy Groundhog Day. Yeah. Now, Cannabis yeah. Carrie is our senior news editor, <laughs> as mentioned. She's got our hemp headlines for us. So what's in the news today? We've got lots of news today. Uh, first off, we have Eric Holder, Attorney General, having to answer some questions in a little bit of hot water today. We're going to talk about that. Um, unfortunately, a bomb investigation leads uh, to a fire. We'll talk more about that. But first up, we're going to start right here in Oregon, where an important case about the definition of usable marijuana. That'll be up first. Oh, yeah. I saw that in my email today. was uh, really happy to see that coming across. I've also got some clips from the uh, testimony of Attorney General Holder in front of the uh, the the House Committee today, where he was questioned on Operation Fast and Furious. That, of course, is the gun walking scandal that uh, allowed a bunch of American guns to just walk out of the country and into the hands of the murderous Mexican cartels. We'll also have an update on that story that we told you earlier on the veterans activist group that offended the uh, POW folks and the veterans for foreign wars. Uh, there's been a change there. Also on today's show, it's Groovin Thursday, so we get some uh, Groovin Thursday music from Ganja John. So, uh, Ganja John, what are we looking forward to today? Wiz Khalifa and Wale in an in, in unofficial mixtape. All right. And, of course, Wiz Khalifa is going to be at the High Times uh, Medical Cannabis Cup accepting his uh, Stoner of the Year Award as well. So that'll be pretty cool. That's in anticipation of. That's right. We've also got Wiz Khalifa hanging out at the end. Not Wiz Khalifa. Oh, damn it. Wiz Khalifa. And uh, your camera's not set up when we're getting oh, that's it's looking, here, it's looking but, at the beautiful, beautiful <laughs> table. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back after this with the news. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Hi, I'm Radical Russ. One of the best things about marijuana is the wonderful aroma. But when you travel a lot like I do, that aroma becomes a suspicious smell. That's why I endorse Stealth-Products.com, the leaders in smell-proof containers. From smell-proof vacuum bags to smell-proof backpacks and duffel bags, all the way to smell-proof digital safes, Stealth-Products.com has you covered. Stealth-Products.com brings you safe, secure, odorless layers of protection 
with activated carbon fiber. Backpacks and duffel bags are simple black so as not to attract attention with a logo or a flashy design. Now, nothing is perfectly odor controlled from the detection of drug dogs, but with proper vigilance, containers from stealth-products.com will help you avoid nosy humans. You're now listening to Elliot Beats. Stealth-products.com. Stealth-products.com. Hey, this is Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger Seeds, TGAgenetics.com, and you're listening to Normal Show Live. Weedmaps.com. I'm Radical Russ from Normal. In my job as outreach coordinator, I travel every month, and when I'm on the road, I need a fast, accurate way to find the medical marijuana dispensaries in the area. So I turn to Weedmaps.com. Weedmaps.com has the best dispensary locator online or on your mobile device. Search by zip code or let Weedmaps find you, and in seconds you'll have the addresses, phone numbers, and customer service reviews for the medical marijuana dispensaries in the local area. Weedmaps.com also has a section devoted to helping you find a doctor who understands and recommends medical marijuana under your state's law. You can even check prices on the Medical Marijuana Stock Exchange. Coming soon, you'll even be able to find the listings of normal attorneys and chapters, local head shops and grow shops, and the best weed-friendly businesses. Weedmaps.com has the information you need to be an informed cannabis consumer. Visit Weedmaps.com today, a proud sponsor of the Normal Network. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, consumer cannabis. It's time for this week's Normal News with Cannabis Carry. A legal battle in Oregon over what constitutes usable weed has ended with a case dismissal. 24-year-old Josh Brewer and a cousin rented a house in Medford, Oregon to grow medical marijuana. Brewer did not want the marijuana around his wife or three young children. They built a 14-foot fence around the backyard and grew 12 plants, six for each of them, according to the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program rules. He said that police from a regional drug task force came to his door one day and asked to see his medical marijuana garden. He let them in because he said he always remains within the law. Two days later at 1.30 a.m. in the morning, he heard his dogs barking and got out of bed to find Medford police at his door. Officers were fine with the two pounds and 10 ounces that he and his cousin had grown and harvested and dried. Each patient is allowed a pound and a half for legal possession. And they didn't care about his plants. They too were within the limits of the state's medical marijuana law. But they discovered two and a half more pounds of marijuana recently harvested and drying on coat hanger suspended from the living room ceiling. Brewer was arrested that night. His drying cannabis was seized, and that began a legal battle over what pers- what is personal use amounts and what is considered usable marijuana. At the time, a motion to dismiss the case based on the usable definition was denied by a judge, and Brewer did have to serve 60 days in jail and three years probation, putting him back on prescription pain pills for an injury that he suffered in a construction accident. But last week on appeal, the state attorney general's office conceded that a 2007 Oregon Court of Appeals ruling had already established that marijuana drying on hangers did not qualify as ready to use. In a brief from Brewer's appeal, it said, without the hanging marijuana, there is no evidence that the defendant possessed more than the lawful amount of usable marijuana. The Oregon law defines usable marijuana as the dried flowers and leaves from the plant. Generally, dry is assumed to mean dry enough to smoke, since the law does not have a definition of how dry dry is. But for now, Brewer is back to gardening, but he says he now takes a branch off at a time, just what he needs. He says that cutting down all your plants at once and hanging them to dry may put you over your limit and set you up for an opportunity to get busted. Brewer says that now his conviction has been reversed. He plans to sue the Medford Police Department and city for $15 million, saying he's prepared for a fight. Well, yeah, I mean, the guy had to do 60 days in jail when he was obeying the law. He went even beyond the call of duty and allowing the cops to come in and check out his garden because he was diligent about following the law. But as cops are wont to do, they're going to try to find any loophole, any technicality they can to haul you in because it's their job to arrest people. So the attorney general has informed the judge in this case that the appeals court ruling from 2007 already determined that marijuana that's been freshly harvested is not usable in the legal definition of the term. If it is drying, it is not yet dried, right? So the 42 ounces of dried marijuana the pair had was within the legal limits, and the 43 ounces of drying marijuana can't count against that. Furthermore, a branch pulled off of a plant to hang and dry itself is not a plant, so those don't count against the six mature plant limit either. 
I mean, this is really amazing. Theoretically speaking, with my caregiver card, I could be sitting here with 24 ounces of dried bud and six mature plants with 10 pounds of bud on them a piece. I could chop off a branch each week and dry it. And so long as I've gone through my dried pound and a half before the pound and a half on the branch dries, I've never broken the law. In fact, theoretically, there's no limit to how much weight in wet drying bud I could be drying here, so long as no more than 24 ounces of it is dry at one time. Now, I can see how law enforcement's freaking out about this. First of all, let there be no doubt that some patients do need 24 ounces of medicine in order to make edibles and tinctures and oils that require so much more plant material. And of course, to hedge against an uncertain supply since we don't have any sort of reasonable retail access to marijuana here in this state. However, I could also see the argument that this is also a huge loophole through which commercial growers can use the medical marijuana law to shield their illegal production. Now, this just goes to show how unworkable it is to carve out an exception to prosecution for 10% of marijuana's users. No matter what firewalls, limits, inspections, or requirements are created for the medical use of cannabis, the overwhelming market forces driving the personal use of marijuana will always find a way to exploit exceptions and thwart limits. Then, those we persuaded for the exceptions will say, see, see, we told you legalizing a little would lead to this. And then they push for tighter restrictions and limits that do nothing to stop the personal use market, but cause huge problems for the medical user who has always been the person least able to function in the illicit market. The family of slain Border Patrol agent Brian Terry has filed a $25 million wrongful death suit against the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and Explosives, citing the government's role in Terry's death. Brian Terry was killed with an AK-47 that was knowingly sold to drug cartels under the Fast and Furious gun running probe that has been in place for several years now. The 65-page suit was served on the government uh, the government agents on Wednesday, according to attorneys of the family. The complaint contends that not only was the ATF negligent in Terry's death, but at the time the program was in direct violation of the ATF's own policies and procedures. The case is a headache for Attorney General Eric Holder, who is already in hot water over the program. Lawmakers have called a hearing about the program and whether Holder has been telling the truth about the program and responding to requests from the House Oversight and Government Relations Committee. Attorney General Eric Holder testified before the House today about his role in the program. The Republicans on the committee pointed out that the Department of Justice was still withholding 93,000 documents that they now intend to subpoena if the Department of Justice doesn't hand them over voluntarily for review. Fast and Furious is the name that was given to the gun tracing operation where agents knowingly allowed gun purchases to Mexican drug operatives so they might be traced to higher echelons of the Mexican drug cartels. They could then pin the guns to the drug cartels to build stronger cases against them if and when they got caught. But even the ATS that ran the program admits that they lost track of hundreds of weapons and that many have been linked to dozens of crimes, including the murder of Border Patrol agent Brian Terry. Many of the guns that have been found in crime scenes in Mexico and during the hearing on Capitol Hill this morning, political lines were drawn very quickly with House Republicans doing most of the grilling on Attorney General Holder and the House Democrats using their time on the mic to point out that the Department of Justice did not begin gun tracing programs under the Obama administration but under George W. Bush's term. President Bush had a similar program called Operation Wide Receiver but the big difference is that the previous program was coordinated with the Mexican authorities. Fast and Furious is purely American. Holder did say that Mexican authorities were aware of the program and that they, he had warned them that that there was no effort to track the weapons once they moved across the border into Mexico. In 2006 and 7, Operation Wide Receiver, operating out of the same Phoenix office, allowed approximately 200 guns to walk into Mexico in an effort to identify higher ups. But from 2009 to 2011, under the Department of Justice Fast and Furious program, nearly 2,000 guns were allowed to get into the hands of Mexican drug cartels. Some about 1,400 of them have been yet to be accounted for. Yeah, this is a big scandal that's brewing up for the Obama administration and Holder. And yeah, there's no doubt that there's some political motivation on the Republican side. You know, the sharks smell blood in the water and they're going to attack. But there's also no denying that there's some blood in the water here that uh, that uh, General Hol uh, Attorney General Holder needs to answer for. I'm going to give you a clip from the C-SPAN proceedings today. This is just one of the uh, congressmen grilling uh, Attorney General Holder. And I like the way he phrased some of these things here. Thank idea. you, Mr. Chairman, and I want, to, I want to thank the Attorney General for helping the committee with its work. I know this is your sixth uh, time. If I could, I'd like to try to put the 
political part of this aside and really out of respect for Agent Brian Terry and his family and the other 117,000 people who work for you, uh, try to look at some reforms that actually might go to the core of, of what went wrong here. Now, I know you've referred repeatedly to a tactic, the tactic of, of gun, gun walking, uh, but really when you drill down on that, what we're allowing here, in this case, uh, in Fast and Furious at least, and in the earlier cases under uh, the Bush administration, basically what the Department of Justice did was authorize criminal activity, criminal activity, to allow folks that they knew, they knew these 20 dealers were buying hundreds of guns and sm heavy, heavy arms, shipping them into, into Mexico. Uh, in my city in Boston, uh, through the office of the FBI, through the uh, confidential informant program, we had folks that were allowed to commit 19 murders under the care and protection of the FBI. I've got a situation right now that's in court where another individual, a con confidential informant, has killed at least a half, alleged to have killed at least a half a dozen people. The problem here is that this tactic actually authorize it, it it puts the law enforcement federal law enforcement in a position of authorizing criminal activity they become complicit in it that's very troubling especially when it results in the in the death of a a, a very uh brave courageous uh agent or to innocent american civil uh, civilian citizens and what is especially troubling that I believe that you didn't know about it. I believe that you didn't know about it. But that's not a comfort to me. It is unbelievable that either the Phoenix field office or the Boston office of the FBI can authorize criminal activity, not just a mere tactic, but a whole strategy of using that uh, outside the law and then having innocent civilians killed. So I actually think one of the solutions might be for Congress to, to, to pass a law that says if, we're gonna, if there are those limited occasions where we're going to authorize criminal activity to go on in our society under the cover of law enforcement's authority, then either yourself as the Attorney General or the Director of the FBI or the head of the ATF has to sign off on it because here everyone escaped responsibility because of plausible deniability. They could say, I didn't know about it. Well, that's troubling. That scares the hell out of me when I think that there's just a, a local office of the ATF or the FBI that's authorizing criminals to engage in this type of activity, taking AK-47s and, and letting them get smuggled into Mexico or, you know, uh, Southern California on our side of the, the border. What, what are you prepared to do? Look, that's, that's, I know that's a blunt instrument saying that you have to sign off on any of these clandestine operations where we're allowing people to engage in criminal activity that puts the public at risk. What, what do you propose to do to make sure we don't have this, I didn't know about it, uh, approach? Sort of the, the, the uh, you know, that guy on, well, the I know nothing, you know, Sergeant know Schultz nothing. defense. Mm -hmm. uh, And just a quick update from that story yesterday on the POW group. Do you remember that one, Russ? Yeah, yeah. Um, the Veterans for Weed. They did cave a little bit. Probably all those um, letters from um, heartfelt letters from, of course, POW's families. They changed their name from Veterans uh, for Weed uh, into Veterans for Weed United. Uh, so closing down a little discrepancy that they had with veterans of foreign wars who didn't really like that they take them taking the VFW. But they're going to keep the logo. They said it's... Uh, 
it, it, it raises some uh, conversation, and they're going to stick with that. All right. Well, thanks for the update, Carrie. And uh, we will get the story on the uh, the explosion in hour two when we get to Toker Talk Radio. We'll talk a little bit about that and how uh, that's connected to the cannabis community. Uh, and we're also uh, going to bring you more coming up here on Normal Show Live. So stick around. We are the voice of the marijuana nation, and uh, we got to get ready for our Groovin' Thursday tune coming up in just a second. In the meantime, we're probably going to have a break. I think we're going to have to take a break with that cool little nail you got going there. We'll talk yeah, about that we'll now. Talk about too. that now too. It's 20 after the hour, and we have to take a short break, if you know what I mean. Please support these sponsors who support Normal Show Live. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? Reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. On February 11 and 12th, the world's premier medical marijuana competition arrives in Los Angeles for the first time ever. That's right. At L.A. Center Studios in Los Angeles, High Times will once again present the Medical Cannabis Cup. There'll be panels and seminars with leaders of the medical marijuana movement, including doctors, patients, researchers, growers, dispensary owners, activists, and High Times' own cultivation editors Nico Escondido and Danny Danko. And don't miss our Saturday night VIP party featuring performances by Ioto and Seedless. Plus... Wiz Khalifa will be on hand to accept High Time Stoner of the Year. Don't forget our closing night Cannabis Cup Award Ceremony, honoring the top indica, sativas, hybrids, concentrates, and edibles entered by California's legally operating cannabis dispensaries and collectives. Go to MedCanCup.com for all the details. Be there February 11th and 12th at L.A. Center Studios in Los Angeles. I don't know. Way too big for you. Pitch was all over the place. Hey, this is Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger Seeds, TGAgenetics.com, and you're listening to The Normal Network. Almost busted in Laredo, but for reasons that I'd rather not disclose. I smoke pot, and I like it a lot. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. I learned a long time ago that marijuana is a lot safer to use than alcohol. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana by adults. It's time we stopped arresting and started respecting responsible marijuana smokers in America. And to learn what you can do to help, please contact Normal at www.norml.org or call toll-free at 888-67-NORMAL. The show was long and we were just sitting there. And we'd come to play, and I'll just for the ride. Pop past 